everybody. It's very nice to be here and meet Atlanta <coughs> area astrobiology community. Uh, my talk is about iron sulfides and prebiotic radix chemistry. So I'm not that much interested in the origins of the polymers. I'm interested in how the small molecules form complex reaction networks and how fire can push there, how complex it can get. Probably all of you have heard about hydrothermal vents and the relevance for the origin of life. Basically, we have hydrothermal springs at the bottom of the ocean and the mixture contact of the hydrothermal waters and seawater creates a stable redox potential and electrochemical gradient. This one is used as a source of energy for, by some of the oldest organisms on Earth. And so hydrothermal vents that create these electrochemical potentials that basically feed some of the oldest archaea and bacteria on Earth. And they also, also have been suggested as a plausible source of energy in other cold and icy worlds where there is not enough sun radiation to do photosynthesis or not enough thermal energy to do other types of reactions. So it's a very widespread source of energy relevant for the origin of life. Also, people have noticed that it's rich with metal sulfides, which are structurally similar to iron sulfide cofactors found in all the living cells. And the structure of the hydrothermal vent chimneys, it's basically the small compartments rich in transition metal sulfides and surrounded by the redox potential that are more reducing in the inside and more oxidizing in the outside. And this looks very similar to how modern cells are organized. So some people think that these small compartments could be the origin of the modern cells. And these transition metals are catalytically active and they can use this electrochemical energy to produce basic electrochemistry, for example, reduce CO2 to small organic molecules. In principle, I'm not that interested about molecules that you can produce in the systems because apart from serpentinization, there are other ways of producing organic molecules, for example, molecules from space. What I'm interested in about how to use this electrochemical energy, which is widely available on Earth, not only in hydrothermal vents, but in other settings too, to run organic reactions, to run the networks of organic reactions that gradually grow more complex and become something resembling living cell. Very basic idea how electrochemical cell works. So if you use electrochemical energy, the easiest way to do it is by using electrochemical cell. You have a power source, which in our case, they are vents. Uh, then you need electrodes to run the reaction on the surface and conductive wires. You can imagine some very basic setup with a small cavity around hydrothermal vent. You have radiation environment, oxidizing environment, and reaction happening. And a cavity rich with organic molecules on the surface of the minerals. Okay, are they conductive minerals? Yes, it results that actually, if you put voltimeter in the inside of the hydrothermal chimney, they're very conductive. And also, most of the transition metal sulfides are conductive. Here, I just focus on iron sulfides because they're similar to iron sulfur cofactors that we have in cells and also to keep the system simple. So as you can see, uh, iron sulfides, machinavite, graygite, and pyrotite are very conductive. And pyrite, depending on its structure, can be conductor or semiconductor, while metal oxides are not that conductive. Then the most important part of electrochemical cell is an electrode. Actually, the electrodes have to be electrically conductive, so it's not a problem for them to exchange electrons with other molecules. It doesn't cost them a lot of energy. Then they have to be chemically stable because you don't want your electrode to be dissolved in the middle of your reaction. They have to be catalytically active. This one is a bit less obvious. What happens is not if you have enough electrochemical energy, not every surface will react with every redox molecule available. There is a kinetic barrier, which is the problem of the geometry and structures. So there should be low kinetic barrier to transform the reaction, the surface has to be catalytically active for the specific molecules. And also you would like a surface that is not especially reactive, so the molecules, once they react, they go in solution to other things and don't stick to the surface. How we can find this ideal mineral electrode? Basically, we use a technique called cyclic voltammetry. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. If you have a redox reaction on the surface of the electron, electrode, you exchange electrons between the molecule and the surface, and this results in electrical current. You can adjust the electrical potential on the surface of your electrode, and this will change the ratio of oxidizing to reducing molecules next to the electrode surface. To adjust it, you, according to the Nernst equation, 
you will have a current, so you will change the ratio, you have more electrons in solution. By slowly changing the redox potential on the surface of the electrode, you will have electrical current with a maximum around the electrical potential corresponding to the uh, electrical potential of the redox reaction of your interest. So what we did, we basically went to the museum, asked for the minerals, made them powder, and made electrodes out of them, and tested them if they react with organic molecules. Our first idea was to use small organic molecules that are usually used in metabolism first scenarios, such as small peptides and carboxylic acids, acetamide, and nothing happened. And then we thought that actually it's not the way how it's done in the living cells. In living cells, small molecules do not react directly with iron sulfide cofactors. They usually react with other redox cofactors. And there are commonly there are four types of redox cofactors, NADH, which is nicotinamide, cytochromes, flavins, and quinones. And if you look at the structure of the quinones, they seem to be some of the oldest molecules known in the universe. They, are, they have been detected in interstellar clouds. Actually, I just stole this picture of quinones in space from NASA website. And they also can be easily produced from polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is the most common source of carbon on Earth, by uh, mixing it with water or ice and basically irradiating it. So we can be almost sure that early Earths had a lot of quinones, or at least some quinones. Also, if you look at electron transport chain, which people argue that the hydrothermal vent small cavities are the analog of, how it works in most of the cells is that you have a series of iron sulfur cofactors, which is the small little globs, that transport the electrons to the quinone, and then the quinone gives electrons to cytochrome or to other organic molecules. So this fragment of metal sulfur cluster giving electrons to quinone, it's highly conserved across all domains of life. And finally, all living organisms, especially bacteria, archaea, and plants, still use quinones a lot for chemical communication. You can find quinones that are redox cofactors. Bacteria use quinones for respiration. A lot of bacteria, in the absence of oxygen, actually use electrons as final electron receptors. And they're also quorum sensing agents. They are wound signals in plants, and they neurotransmitters in higher animals. So this is the quinones that we still have in our body. We tested our minerals against quinones. Mm, so the result was somewhat surprising. Metal sulfides usually used in prebiotic chemistry studies are reduced cofactors because they're more conductive and more reactive, like, such as machinavide, gray guide, and parotide. But none of them was reactive with quinones. Actually, once put in water, they would start slowly to decompose. Pirate was very reactive with all the quinones that we tested. And the surprising thing was that pirate was actually more reactive than commercially available electrodes made of platinum or carbon. As you can see here, it's a bit complicated. But the redox potential between for oxidation and reduction of molecule called hydroquinone. For pirates, the difference between two peaks is smaller than for glassy carbon electrode, meaning that it requires less energy. You can also see that there is more current going through pirate electrodes than through glassy carbon electrode, showing that the reaction is much faster. So we actually found an electrode made of stones, which works better than commercially available purified electrodes, which is an interesting thing, probably not related to the origin of life. We also were interested how the reaction work about kinetic. What we did, we changed the speed with which we changed the redox potential, and it causes increase in the current. And if this increase is proportional to the square root of the change of the rate of redox potential, it means that the reaction is diffusion controlled. What we saw is that most of the oxidation of quinones were diffusion controlled, so quinone would take the electrons and go away and do other things. The only ones that had little bit precipitation was the quinone called hydroquinone, which is no to polymerize spontaneously. So it didn't perform worse than it usually performs in solution. And then we tested the reaction over more than 100 cycles, and the electrode was stable. So the reaction can go over and over and over and over again. We don't create an intermediates or side products. So finally, we found our ideal electrode, and it's one of the most common minerals on Earth, reacting with one of the most common 
organic molecules on Earth, which makes it highly plausible for the origin of life. It's conductive, it's stable, it's active, and the surface doesn't stick to the molecules of our interest. This was more experimental and kinetic consideration. What about thermodynamics? If we think about redox reactions found in biology, they actually occur in pretty narrow redox potential, which is more or less between minus 100 and minus 300 millivolts. And you can see that if you compare the redox potentials necessary with, uh, to perform organic reactions in the cell, with the region of stability of iron minerals, you see that pirate overlaps with pretty much all the organic redox reaction needed for the cell. You can argue that actually the composition of the seawater and early earth was different, and so the stability of the mineral was different, and if you can, but still, Pirate would be less stable compared to more reduced iron sulfides in the absence of oxygen and at low sulfur concentration of early ocean, but the stability is still enough to basically overlap with all the organic reactions that we know all that we need to construct this cell. And I'm not sure if you recognize this guy. He is basically one of the fathers of biochemistry, who basically is responsible for half of the things he wrote in the biochemistry textbook. He Ka discovered the citric acid cycle. He showed how ATP is necessary for muscle contraction. He also discovered uh, ascorbic acid. And he spent a lot of time thinking how the simple chemical reactions lead to life. What he said that quinones seem to play a most important role in cell life. And future knowledge of the properties might bring us closer to the understanding of the living state. So this is it for now. I want to thank Professor David Lin, who doesn't mind me having side projects, and my previous supervisors at Harvard, George Whitehead, Dimitri Sasolov, and Harvard Origins Initiative, who paid for the initial, like, who paid my postdoc salary. And here's the food for thought. <laughs> Thank you. Um, could you put the slide up where you had the comparison of the uh, cyclical hemograms of the different iron? This one? No, the one before that where you showed, you showed that pirate was more active. Yeah, okay. Um, that's interesting because when you cleave pyrite or you crush it, the termination is not FES2. It's, so the, the surface of pyrite is not pyrite. So I'm wondering, it's more like FES. So uh, I was wondering, you know, have you really looked carefully at what is the electrode surface itself? Because uh, I would be surprised if it's FES2 terminated. We did x I mean, we did X-ray of the bulk mineral, but not of the entire surface. Uh, well, in this case, I don't. It's a good thing to look at, I think, to see what is the geometry. FPS will be more relevant, I guess, to iron sulfur clusters. Uh, but in terms of materials, I mean, I don't know. It's a good question. But still, it would be something in between the other. Yeah, it is. I mean, in the FES, it looks like it works pretty well, too. Uh, which the, one? The, the top one, yeah, yeah. Or the paratite? The top one. Uh, Machinavite. Machinavite, they all look the same, so it actually did. I mean, Machinavite in water, in the potential range, which is like corresponds to potential range of the cells, it starts to decompose and solubilize. And Pirate, what we did, we did the first scan that we did stabilizes the surface. It did look different to the other scans, but so I'm not sure how to change the surface. Probably we need to do more surface characterization for that. Okay, so we need to move to the next speaker. Let's thank, let's thank Olga.